Now we're going to move on to the polymerase chain reaction. The polymerase chain reaction is a favorite topic to be quizzed about on the boards. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a technique that's been around for almost about 20 years now. But the polymerase chain reaction is a way to very quickly amplify DNA within a test tube. Initially, the PCR machines were huge. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, were huge. They took up entire rooms. And then they got smaller and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. Now they even have pocket PCR machines. You can put them in your pocket, and go to lunch, and have your, your PCR machines going, going uh, the whole day long while, you, while you're doing other things. So the polymerase chain reaction, as I'd said, it's a way to take, to take DNA and amplify. You could start with one little double-stranded DNA molecule, and using PCR, you could very quickly get millions or billions of copies of that DNA molecule. So the idea behind PCR is that you have a region. You're not trying to amplify the entire human genome. You're trying to amplify a little target sequence. Why would you want to amplify a target sequence? Maybe you're trying to see if a person has a particular mutation that changes the length of that sequence. Maybe you're trying to, uh, to do an experimental study where you need more copies of the DNA. Maybe you just have a tiny little sample of DNA and you need more of it so that you can analyze that DNA. So there's many reasons why you might want to use the polymerase chain reaction or PCR, but let's go through the technique of how it's utilized. I want you to think of it this way. Basically, PCR is the exact same thing you see within the body regarding DNA replication, but there's a key exception. And what that is, is, is that we have the luxury in the test tube of blasting the DNA with heat. You know, we can't blast our body with heat if we get much above, you know, 40 degrees Celsius, we're getting into trouble. Well, in the test tube, we can actually heat the DNA up to 100 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Celsius. And it doesn't present a problem because we're in a test tube. All right, let's look at how PCR works. So basically, what you're going to need are the following components. You're going to need a template from which the PCR is going to amplify. You need a polymerase. Now, typically in PCR, it's a thermostable polymerase. It's going to be something like TAC polymerase, derived from Thermus aquaticus, a, a thermostable organism that leaves the, lives at the bottom of the ocean. It's going to be PFU polymerase, vent, deep vent polymerase, one of these DNA thermostable polymerases. You're going to need excess primers because the primers are going to provide you with specificity. The primers are going to dictate which region of the DNA you're analyzing are, is going to be amplified. That's what the primers are for. And of course, you need excess building blocks. You need excess deoxynucleoside triphosphates as building blocks for building the DNA. So you need all the same things you need in the cell, pretty much. You don't need the helicase or the topoisomerase because you're just going to use heat to separate the strands. You do need primers. You're going to need a primer for both strands, and you're going to need excess building blocks, the deoxynucleoside triphosphates. All right, so here's how PCR works. You need a primer, you have double-stranded DNA, and you need a primer that's going to amplify each or make a complementary copy to each of these strands. So you need a primer that's complementary to strand one that will amplify in this direction, and you need a primer complementary to strand two that's going to amplify in this direction. The rules haven't changed. The template strand still has to be read from three prime to five prime, and the product still has to be synthesized from five prime to three prime. That's never going to change. So when we look back down at our, our uh, polymerase chain reaction here, you can see that you can, you can heat up the strands, you can add the primers, Okay, you can cool, the, prime, cool the, the reaction down. When you cool the reaction down, the primers are going to base pair complementarily with their target sequence. And then, of course, you're going to add the heat-stable DNA polymerase. You'll actually heat it back up a little bit. And when that happens, this is going to extend. This strand right here is going to be red from 3' prime to 5', prime, 
and the new DNA is going to be synthesized from 5 to 3 prime. This strand up here is going to be red from 3 to 5 prime, and the new DNA is going to be synthesized from 5 prime to 3 prime. So at the end of the first round of PCR, what you effectively have is a partial copy of strand 1 and a partial copy of strand 2. The sequence that you're most interested in amplifying is right in the middle here. You're interested in amplifying this sequence in the middle. So that's the sequence over time that's going to be amplified. It's not the entire genome that's going to be amplified. It's this target region that's going to be targeted. So let's look at how this now works after the first cycle ends and the second cycle begins. What we're going to do is we're going to have a second cycle where each of the strands is going to be amplified again. But now instead of starting with one double-stranded DNA molecule, we have two double-stranded DNA molecules. So for each of these strands, a primer is going to bind, it's going to read from 3 to 5 prime, and it's going to synthesize a product from 5 to 3 prime. So you'll end up with this product as a result of that. This particular strand is going to be read from 3 prime to 5 prime. A new product will be made from 5 to 3 prime, and an appropriate product will be synthesized. Shown over here, the other strand, the other double-stranded DNA that was created in the first round of PCR, the same thing will happen. This strand will be read from 3 to 5, and a new product will be synthesized from 5 to 3. This will be read from 3 to 5 prime, and a new product will be synthesized from 5 to 3. So in the end, what we're doing is we're amplifying the region that we make our primers specific to. The primer is going to dictate which sequence gets amplified. At the end of a third cycle, after we repeat heat and cool, now keep in mind that in PCR, we're going to put everything we need into the test tube. We're going to put enough template, we're going to put enough primers, we're going to put enough enzyme, we're going to put enough of our uh, building blocks, the deoxynucleotide triphosphates, so that this reaction can cycle over and over and over again. So we go, at, as we cycle, we go from one double-stranded DNA to two to four. The next cycle gives us eight and then 16 and 32 and 64 and 128 and 256 and so on and so forth. And so we're exponentially going to increase the amount of DNA that we have within that test tube. So at the end of this third cycle, we see that now we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight copies. And at the end of the fourth cycle, we're going to have 16 and so on and so forth. At the end of 20 cycles of PCR, we're going to have about a million copies of that target DNA sequence that we were interested in. That's what we're going to have. So at the end of 30 rounds of PCR, you can do the math, we would have a billion copies of the target sequence we're interested in. So in this way, we can start with a very small sample size of DNA, and we, we can make a huge amount of that DNA from it. It could be analyzed, it could be experimented with many different utilities. That's PCR. It's a way to amplify DNA. A 59-year-old man who has all the clinical manifestations of Huntington's disease. And in the vignette, they give you the information of a blot to determine, can you confirm by looking at the blot that the patient indeed has Huntington's disease based on his clinical manifestations and based on the blot? Now, what happens is in the vignette, they talk about a region of the Huntington gene that's been amplified by PCR. And that region of the gene that's amplified has the codon CAG. And in Huntington's disease, there's an amplification of CAG, 20 times, 30 times, 40 times in amplification. And so the idea is by amplifying that region of the Huntington gene that has a CAG repeat by looking at the blood, can you confirm is the diagnosis consistent with Huntington's disease? All right. Now, in this blot on the right side, you can see the control lane. Now, in the control lane, there are two bands because we have two genes for Huntington's gene, one gene inherited from the mother, other gene inherited from the father. So that region of the gene that's amplified by PCR, we see two bands. 
in this vignette. One of them is 101 base pairs in length. The other one is 95 base pairs in length. Which one came from a mother or the father doesn't matter. But what is important, that region of the gene that's amplified, that has a CAG repeat, in the patient's lane, there are two bands. One band is approximately 104 base pairs, which is approximately equal to the other two. Not, not a big deal. But the other pants is significantly larger in size. That's the one likely amplified where the codon is amplified to give a much larger band. Now, of the two bands in the control, which one got amplified that got, that gave rise to Huntington's disease? If it's the upper band in the control, and they got amplified, that difference of 170 versus 101, the difference is 90, 69 base pairs. And 69 base pairs or 69 nucleotides is equal to 3 times 23 base pairs or 3 times 23 nucleotides. 3 nucleotides is a codon. So what happens is 23 codons, 23 trinucleotide repeats have been amplified going from 101 to 170. So it is consistent with Huntington's disease. A codon has been amplified 23 times to give rise to the Huntington phenotype. Now, if it's the other band, the 95 base pairs that got amplified, that difference there is 75 base pairs in length. And that number is equal to 3 times 25. So if it's the lower band in the control that got amplified in the patient, then there's 25 codons, 25 trinucleotide repeats that have been amplified. But it doesn't matter. Either band in the control that got amplified in the patient, that amplification is consistent with a diagnosis of Huntington's disease. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is paternity testing. Somebody's going to be either really happy or somebody's going to be really upset based on the results of these paternity tests. How is this particularly done? How is this, how is this accomplished uh, in the laboratory? Well, the way this is accomplished in the laboratory is that we would take a uh, particular mother who's usually not in doubt. We would take a child and then we would take a male who's going to be tested to see whether or not he's likely to be the father of this child. In order to do paternity testing, we usually look at repetitive DNA sequences. So throughout our genome, we have repetitive DNA sequences. Sometimes we call these microsatellites. The microsatellites in related individuals have consistent numbers of repeats. So for this particular example, we're looking at ACAT repeats. And the number of ACAT bases that get repeated in a particular region of DNA can be detected, detected using PCR analysis. We can use PCR, we can amplify that repetitive sequence of ACAT, and we can then figure out how many ACAT repeats are there. Based on those numbers, we can then work backwards and say, aha, did this person inherit those repeats from a tested father? Did this child inherit his repeats from this particular individual? Well, let's look. Now, you can see in this tested child, they have 15 ACAT repeats. How many bases does that correspond to? Well, 15 times four bases is, of course, gonna be 60. So this would be a 60 base pair length fragment. This child also is going to have a 10 times 4 or 40 base pair fragment, which says that they have 10 ACAT repeats. Which did they inherit from the mother? Well, if you analyze the mother, you can see that she has a 10, a 10 a number of 10 ACAT repeats, so she has 40 base pair fragment there. And she also has 7 ACAT repeats, so a 28 base pair fragment, a base fragment right there. Now, where did she inherit these from? She inherited them from her parents, which we're not even going to bring into the picture here. But when she passed these alleles off to her offspring, it's very clear that she passed off the 10 ACAT repeats to this particular child. Maybe one of her other children, she passed off the 7 ACAT repeats. You would have to test that other child to see. So what you're left with is that this child also has 
15 ACAT repeats in this particular amplified region. And when you test this particular male, when you test this particular male, you see that he has 15 ACAT repeats, and that corresponds to this particular child. So in this particular situation, you can see that the mother passed off 10 ACAT repeats, the father passed off 15, and all is good with the universe. We have a child that was probably a product of this tested male and this mother. So this guy is obviously very relieved, or perhaps he's a little surprised. Now keep in mind that you're not going to be able to just look at, at one ACAT repeat to tell definitively whether a child is, uh, is from a particular male, tested male. You'd have to look at four to eight of these repeats to, uh, to definitively say that. Let's look at another situation. Let's look at a tested child. This is a tested child, and you can see that this child has uh, two ACAT repeats. We're not even going to look at the size of these. We're just going to look at the pattern. We could see that the mother was tested, and she has two ACAT repeats, uh, and one of them we can clearly see was derived from this particular mother. Where did the child derive this ACAT repeat from? Was it from this tested male? Probably not, right? This child could not have gotten these ACAT repeat from this tested male because this male didn't have that size fragment. So if this male is perhaps married to this mother, okay, this mother's in big trouble, okay? So this particular child probably has another genetic father. Keep in mind, once again, you would have to look at a huge number, maybe four to eight of these, and we call these variable nucleotide tandem repeats. These are variable nucleotide tandem repeats because the number of ACAT repeats or whatever other bases you're looking at is a variable in number. And they're tandem repeats because they're repeated one after another. So this is a variable nucleotide tandem repeat way of using PCR to analyze to test for paternity. The next technique we're going to look at is called DNA sequencing. Now, it's very possible that you will be given a DNA sequencing gel on the exam, and you will be asked to say what the DNA sequence is of a particular gene based on analyzing that sequencing gel. How is that accomplished? Let's look. So, if we look at a DNA sequencing, what you do is you typically take some DNA sample that you need to analyze, you take excess primers that are going to be used to analyze the DNA sequence or amplify that sequence. You need deoxynucleotide triphosphates as a building block for the DNA sequence. And you need DNA polymerase, of course, which is going to do the job of amplifying the DNA. Now, the special thing about this, which is the dideoxy method of, of sequencing, the dideoxy method of sequencing utilizes something special called a dideoxy nucleotide triphosphate. And what a, a dideoxy nucleotide triphosphate is, it's basically a base that gets incorporated into the growing chain of DNA. And when it gets incorporated, it doesn't have a free three prime end in order to incorporate a new base. That's why it's dideoxy. It's DD. It's dideoxy. So both the two prime and the three prime carbon have their oxygen removed. So these have been engineered in the lab so that any time one of these bases is incorporated into a growing strand, it's truncated. The synthesis of the DNA is truncated. Now, the dideoxy nucleotide triphosphates will be radio labeled so that any time one of them was incorporated into the DNA, it will be evident on a gel. So with all that being said, the most important thing that you remember is how to read a sequencing gel. So down here, if this were a particular sequencing gel, this would be the lanes where you saw bands whenever the radio labeled dideoxy ATP was added. So whenever you saw one of these bands, it means that a, fra a fragment of DNA was created of that length where A was the last base. You see a lane of C's. So whenever C was incorporated into a growing strand of DNA, 
Well, whenever you see a band here, C was the last base. Same thing for G and same thing for T. And remember that when you look at a sequencing gel, it's going to separate DNA from negative to positive, typically that's the convention, and the smallest is going to be closest, the smallest fragment is going to be closer to the positive end. So when we read a DNA sequencing gel, we read it from the bottom up, unless we flip it over, right? But they're not going to do that to you. You're going to assume, if given no other information, that you're reading from the bottom up to the top, from the smallest to the largest fragments, or from the positive up to the negative end. So when we read this particular sequence of DNA, we're going to start at the bottom, and we see that the first sequence is C, and then we're going to see that the next two bases were T, T, and that the next two bases were G, G, and then we move over here to A, and then once again A, and then T, and we're just working our way up, then C, then G, then T, then A. You would put that sequence down, okay, on your piece of paper there, you would write that sequence down as you're moving up the gel, and you would then have the appropriate DNA sequence from that sequencing gel. Okay, if you're asked about that on an exam day, now you have a good way to approach answering it. Finally, we're going to look at how to quantify viral load in HIV patients. It's very likely you're going to get some questions on the USMLE Step 1 about HIV patients. Now, you know that if you're just wanting to see if a patient's HIV positive, you're going to do an ELISA screen to screen the patient's sera to see if there's antibodies that cross-react or that just react in general with viral proteins. And if that comes up positive, you're going to do a more sophisticated test, the Western blot, to see whether the patient's antibodies specifically react with the viral proteins. Okay, the Western blot is a more sophisticated test. It's the confirmatory test for HIV, whereas the ELISA test is just the, the screening test. Now, if your goal is to try to see how much virus a patient has been exposed to, okay, you could do one of two things. You could either just see, has, does this patient carry the HIV virus integrated into their T cells? If you wanted to do that, you could simply do PCR, and you could look for and try to amplify the viral genome. But if your goal, your goal is to quantify how much virus has infected and integrated into this patient's T cells, you're gonna to wanna to use a special type of PCR called reverse transcriptase PCR. So once again, regular PCR detects the presence of the virus, whereas reverse transcriptase PCR will allow you to detect viral load. Okay, let's look. So to accomplish this type of experiment, you're gonna take RNA from the blood sample so you're not, you're not looking for the integrated virus, you're looking for the amount of virus that's just present in that individual. In the laboratory, you can use reverse transcriptase enzyme. Reverse transcriptase is going to take the RNA retrovirus, it will reverse transcribe it and make a cDNA copy from this. The next thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna use PCR that has primers specific for the HIV cDNA. So you'll have already designed these primers ahead of time. So they will amplify the HIV cDNAs. And doing this in a quantitative way, you can now have a PCR amplification of how much of the initial RNA virus was present in the blood sample. So by using reverse transcriptase and then PCR, you can obtain a certain amount of amplified PCR product. This is done under very controlled situations. Now, control curves have already been developed so that we know that based on how much HIV virus you see, or I should say how much PCR product you see in the uh, eventual end of this experiment, you can then go to a curve and say, aha, this is how much viral load this patient must have. And that's what's shown in panel B. This is a standard curve which compares the amount of amplified PCR product on the y-axis to the concentration of HIV RNA that would be present in the original sample. This experiment was done well ahead of time. So 
What you do is you'll come and you'll see how much PCR product you got amplified. And wherever this lies on this curve, you're going to come and come over to the standard curve and extrapolate down to tell you how much HIV viral load was present in the original blood. Let's say for fun that this patient had this much arbitrary amount of PCR product amplified. You would then come over to this standard curve and you would extrapolate down and this would tell you the concentration of virus, of HIV RNA in the original sample and it would be given in terms of units of copies per mil of serum. That's how you could determine viral load. So if you're asked to do this, you just simply utilize that standard curve. Remember that it's reverse transcriptase PCR or RT-PCR for short. That's going to be utilized to determine the viral load in a particular patient's sample. This is going to bring us to a close of chapter 7. Now this was techniques of genetic analysis, a lot of basic techniques that are used in the laboratory to detect disease, uh, to detect particular alleles in a patient, to analyze southern blots, to utilize PCR and reverse transcriptase PCR. Uh, the utility of these is, is many in the clinical laboratory. The utility you're going to need to study from the exam is to be able to use these techniques or understand them in a way so that you can take questions, analyze data, and come up with a logical answer.